Hello, I'm Robert Veal, and in this video, I'll be talking about one of Italy's Baroque masterpieces, the Basilica of Santa Maria della Salute in the city of Venice. Constructed in the 17th century, this church occupies a magnificent position on a narrow promontory separating the Judeca Canal from the entrance to the Grand Canal, just in the area known as the Bacino or the Basin in front of St. Mark's Square. Ever since its construction, it has become a visual landmark of the city, drawing the admiration of grand tourists and subsequent visitors to the, to the city of Venice, La Serissima. The prominent position can be seen in this slide with the Judeca Canal to the left and the Grand Canal snaking its way through the centre of the city from the Bacino down towards the modern railway station of the city. Now, the church was built in the 17th century, which is rather unusual in Venice's history because it's a period where the city is entering decline. In the Middle Ages, the city had rose to prominence as a great maritime empire, trading throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and north through its trade networks as far as Scandinavia and the United Kingdom. But by the 17th century, it was definitely in decline. There was a political crisis in the early decade of the 17th century uh, involving a dispute between the church in Rome and Venice over who had the right to try two priests who had committed heinous crimes. What started as a legal dispute soon rose to an international um, dispute involving France and Spain, as well as Venice and the church in Rome, and led to the Venetian people being placed under an interdict, which put them uh, free from their bonds of loyalty to the Doge and the Senate of Venice. This was a politically potentially explosive situation. Even worse, in 1630, the final great plague came to the city. Now, for hundreds of years as a port city and a maritime empire, Venice had been subjected to the plague and they had developed quite sophisticated uh, infection control measures. But nevertheless, the plague which came in 1630 was devastating, killing some 50,000 Venetians, about a third of the population. The economy and the society of Venice took decades recover, to recover and some historians claim that the city never ever fully recovered from the 1630 plague. Finally, as an empire, Venice was also on the slide and the year 1669 is important. This is when the colony of Crete, the last of the great Venetian colonies, was lost to the Ottoman Turks, cutting off a source of wealth and of pride for the Venetians. It's remarkable then in such a context that the church is built at all, but in fact we have the plague of 1630 to thank for this. So the name of the church, Santa Maria della Salute, literally means St Mary of Health. And the health that's being referred to is the recovery or the survival of the city after the plague of 1630. In spite of the relatively sophisticated infection control division, uh, provisions that were created uh, in the city, the Venetians still thought that it was the wrath of God that caused the plague to come in the first place. And so they had, they were careful to give thanks to the Virgin Mary in this case for interceding on the city and building a magnificent cathedral with public funds to demonstrate to God and the Virgin Mary what a pious city Venice was. Indeed, we still have the original document from the Senate in which they agree to build uh, the church saying how necessary it is to humbly beseech God through the construction of this great uh, building uh, that's here. Rather more rationally, uh, the Senate then has a competition, a design competition, and that's won by Baldassare Longena, a Venetian architect working in the Baroque style, who spends most of his career working on the building, and this remains his great masterpiece of architecture. The construction, as you can see, took place over a very long period, more than 50 years, and Longena dies just one year after the completion of the Basilica. Unlike the other churches in Venice, including the other large plague church of the Redentore, this is built on a central plan 
and it's the only significant central plan building in Venice, which is one of the ways, one of the reasons uh, why it is so uh, distinctive. So as well as the Senate documents, we also have Longina's own writings in the form of his submission to the competition and in later writings, where he claims rather immodestly of the greatness and the originality of the building. And in particular, he reminds us how original his central plan building was. So in the original competition entry, he says, I have created a church in the form of a rotunda, a work of new invention, not built in Venice, a work very worthy and desired by many. This church, having the mystery of its dedication being dedicated to the Blessed Virgin, made me think with what little talent God has bestowed upon me of building the church in the shape of a crown. And later on in his private writings, he reminds us of his originality one further time. Firstly, it is a virgin work, never before seen, curious, worthy and beautiful, made in the form of a round monument that has never been seen, nor ever before invented, neither altogether nor in part, in other churches in this most serene city. Just as my competitor has done for his own advantage, being poor in invention. So he's claiming, therefore, that the other competition entry that had a central plan by his competitor uh, was a knockoff of his own, uh, designs. And so from um, Baldessare Longena's own writings, we understand that the dome uh, of the church, this magnificent semicircular dome, is a metaphor for a crown, the crown of Mary, the Queen of Heaven, Regina Coeli, one of the manifestations uh, of the Virgin uh, Mary. Looking at this wonderful photograph, you'll see that, however, that that's supplemented by a secondary dome uh, built just to the left over the apse area uh, of the church. There are more references to the Virgin Mary in the architecture as well. It's an eight sided building. You can see three of those sides on the image on the left. Now, an eight sided star is a reference to the Virgin Mary in another manifestation, the Star of the Sea, the Stella Maris. And those eight pointed stars, rather compass-like, uh, are another feature of the decoration of the building. You can see one there uh, in the image uh, on the right-hand side uh, of your screen. And of course, Venice being so wedded to the sea in terms of its commerce and its very image, uh, that particular manifestation of the Virgin Mary is an important one for the city. The foundations of the building were, of course, the first thing that were built, and this was an enormous piece of engineering. Uh, it is said that 100,000 wooden piles, four metres long, were dug into the sandy base um, of the Venetian lagoon in order to hold up the building. Now, this had been a building technique, of course, which had been practised in Venice for hundreds and hundreds of years. The timber came from the forests of the Alps not so far away. However, the construction of this building so high and so heavy was an altogether new challenge. 100,000 of those wooden piles um, is an amazing amount of timber. Over the centuries since the construction, this figure has been uh, exaggerated considerably. And so you'll read quite authoritative accounts that tell you that there are 1 million or 1,106,000 of these columns and that they were put into place over a two year period, this would, in, would have involved the laying of more than 1,400 of these wooden piles every day, which of course was a clearly impossible uh, task. And so that number is highly exaggerated. Another thing that's highly exaggerated is Longina's claim to originality. And so here, by way of comparison, we're looking at the ground plan of a much older church the 6th century church of San Vitale in Venice, built at the, in the Byzantine period and believed to have been commissioned by no less than the Byzantine emperor Justinian, who in the decade previously had reconquered Italy in the name of the Roman Empire of the East. This is Italy, which had been lost to the barbarians. Looking at the design of, um, of San Vitale, one sees three sections the narthex or the exterior veranda, which was typical uh, of the design of Byzantine churches, 
and an apse in which there are magnificent uh, mosaics, which one can still see today, the area where the ritual of the church uh, took place, where the clergy seated themselves and separated themselves from the congregation, and the beautiful and large eight-sided nave. Now, looking across to the right at the plan of Santa Maria della Salute, one can see how closely Baldassare Longhena has followed this plan, and so the narthex of the church is of San Vitale is echoed in this diamond shape staircase that leads you up to the entrance to the church. Once inside we have a columned eight-sided nave building and then a separated apse area, in Longina's case in an entirely separate structure behind an archway leading from one of the eight sides uh, of the interior. So whilst Longina says that his um, building and his construction is original for the city of Venice. It's certainly not the case that's original in the history of architecture, and there's no doubt that Longena would have known about this building just a few hours away. So on the left uh, is the exterior of the Church of San Vitale, uh, and on the right, the much higher and much more ornate facade uh, of Santa Maria della Salute. Now, uh, the Byzantine building on the left is very typical of Byzantine buildings which had very plain exteriors but were sumptuously decorated in colourful gold uh, and bright mosaics on the interior, whereas Santa Maria della Salute on the right is much more a product of the 17th century and particularly the influence of the flamboyant architecture of the Roman Baroque of Bernini and Borromini. Uh, those sculptors and architects who created such magnificent buildings uh, in the south. There are clear reflections of that in Longina's uh, exterior. But surely another influence on the central plan was the architecture of Andrea Palladio, who'd come from Vicenza, but in the last part of his career had undertaken two major church commissions in the city of Venice. And so we're looking now at a photograph and a plan and a section of his famous Villa Capra, uh, better known as La Rotonda, uh, which is based on the Pantheon in Rome and incorporates the cylindrical um, shape of the rotonda on the inside with a classical temple facade. Uh, Palladio had travelled uh, to Rome and he had seen the Pantheon uh, and imitated it in the design of this villa. What's more, he'd become famous because he'd published his 10 books of architecture, uh, which provided written explanations and drawings uh, of his buildings. So there is, can be no doubt whatsoever that Longano uh, was very aware of his predecessor Palladio's buildings and his centrally planned buildings. However, Palladio is building a Baroque building uh, and the dynamism uh, of the architecture is important to understand and it is allowed for and created by the eight-sided shape. Unlike a single flat facade, as you typically get uh, in a Renaissance building, a, a classical facade, the eight sides means that as you move around the outside of the building, the architectural elements move in relation to one another. So as one stands on one side, one can't see the other sides and they only come into view as you move around and as you move around the building walk around the building some elements such as the statues or the architectural details of the different pediments begin to appear and disappear and move in relationship to one another so it's a totally different much more sculptural experience rather than looking uh, at a single facade so typical of a renaissance building and that that is typical uh, of uh, the baroque uh, it's something I think that's very much inspired by sculpture, the idea that you admire this building from various sides and that as you move around, much as you move around a sculpture, what you see changes and the relationship of elements uh, with one another also changes. So thoroughly Baroque in that idea. Um, that Baroque dynamism is also extended to the pavement design, which you can see here uh, in this aerial photograph, this interesting uh, geometric composition of ovals, of rectangles and triangles imitating the basic formal characteristics of the three-dimensional building itself. Moving to the inside of the building, one sees an extension of the Baroque flavour of the exterior, but the introduction of a distinctly 
oriental feel. Now, central planned buildings were, of course, typically oriental. They may not have been seen in Venice or very much in the West, but they were certainly seen uh, in the East, and most particularly in the church of um, the Hagia Sophia in uh, Constantinople, and then the Ottoman mosques, which had begun to be built in the city after the Ottoman conquest of 1453. Uh, the Turks had adorned the city. And so th there are direct architectural parallels here with which, with what one would have seen in the city of Constantinople. We've got a long lantern and we've got a rather mysterious dark light on the lower levels. Uh, and the fact that you walk in one of the doorways and you can't see in a rational way the other chapels. And one has to move around to get a full sense uh, of the building. So a sort of kind of Eastern mystery. Much more Western and much more classical is the magnificent light that comes in from the very big windows that are around the base of the cupola and also from the lantern. Uh, this is a thoroughly Palladian feature. Palladio had used this lighting in his other churches uh, in Venice, the Church of San Giorgio Maggiore and the Church of Redentore. So once again, there's no doubt that Longhena is taking a leaf out of Palladio's book here in this magnificent uh, light. Finally, the high altar and the magnificent triumphal or classical arch which surrounds it are also worthy of our attention. Uh, so the arch, as I said, is classical, rather like a triumphal arch, but it's absolutely stuffed with architectural detail. Full columns, semi-columns and pilasters, oversized cornices uh, and sculptural detail um, in the niches, uh, but also in the pendentives, that very stuffed in feel, which once again is very typical of uh, the Roman Baroque. But that's all a framing device for a very ornate and very sculptural high altar, which once again is very typical of the Baroque style it brings to mind, does it not, the sculpture of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who'd been working in Rome during the time of the construction of this church. But this time we have a Flemish Baroque artist who in Italian, his name is Giusto Le Corte, who undertakes this work uh, in 1670. Uh, and it is a metaphor of Venice's survival of the plague. So in the middle, of course, you have the Virgin Mary holding the child and that child is held up by a putto, uh, a, a cherub, who is an agent in this case of the Virgin Mary. And on the left, we have the figure of Venice or the personification uh, of Venice, who is looking up to the Virgin Mary and pleading to her to intercede and to save the city from the plague. And indeed, this comes to pass because on the right, we have a figure of the plague holding her arms up in horror, head turned with a terrified gaze towards the Virgin Mary being pushed out of the scene by one of these putto, one of the uh, cupids, the agents of the Virgin Mary. The icon uh, that's down the bottom uh, of the image is also worthy of our attention. This is a Greek uh, icon, and in fact, it comes from the island of Crete, and it depicts the Virgin, the Madonna, the Mediator, entirely appropriate, of course, for the subject matter here of the cathedral, the very theme of the entire cathedral. Significantly, this icon was rescued from Heraklion in Crete when the Ottoman Turks took over the island in 1669 and found place in Justo Le Corte's altarpiece for Santa Maria del Valite. Very quickly now at the end, uh, a tour of some of the paintings of the building. Now it's fair to say that this is not the greatest Venetian painting. And it's interesting uh, that in the 1660s, when the Senate of Venice was looking for artists to decorate the interior, they had to go outside the city of Venice. There was no longer Carpaccio, Bellini, Titian or Tintoretto to call upon. And so artists such as uh, Pietro Liberi, who we can see here, uh, showing Venice at the feet of St. Anthony of Padua, that important Franciscan saint, or the work of Luca Giordano telling the story of the Virgin Mary or the decorations. Now, Luca Giordano was very much the go-to artist for religious painting in the later 17th century. He worked throughout the Italian peninsula. He was reliable and he was fast. In fact, his nickname in Italian was Luca fa presto. Luca does it quickly. So these are dramatic works, but certainly very quickly uh, commissioned and perhaps not of the same artistic level uh, of the great works of the Venetian uh, Renaissance. 
Finally, let us not forget the magnificent position of Santa Maria della Salute. I've already mentioned its location at the entrance of the Grand Canal, but this also has to be understood in terms of its relative position uh, compared to other great monuments in Venice, including the Piazza San Marco, the Doge's Palace, uh, and then in the rectangle that I've got there down at the bottom of the slide, uh, on the bottom right, San Giorgio Maggiore with its Church of State built by Palladio uh, in the 16th century. And then in the bottom left, the Church of the Redentore, also built by Palladio uh, in uh, the 16th century to give thanks for Venice surviving the plague of 1576. In that case, the church was dedicated to Christ the Redeemer, Il Redentore. The lines that you can see there, the white lines, show the visual relationship uh, between the Doge, the Doge's palace, uh, and these three buildings. So they're all within line of sight of the Doge's palace, and they're all there, if you like, uh, as scenery, as background scenery for this great stage that is the Bacino, the basin in front of St. Mark's. This is where so many of the ceremonies of state took place. And indeed, there were two very specific ceremonies associated with the Church of Santa Maria della Salute and with the Redentore that involved building bridges of boats across either the Grand Canal or the Judeca Canal and processions which began uh, in the Doge's Palace, um, crossing over to those churches at particular times of the year in order to give thanks to the Virgin Mary. And of course, being in such a prominent position, Santa Maria della Salute figures in countless works of art, in countless vedute or urban landscapes of the city of Venice, which were so popular with grand tourists. Here we're looking at Francesco Guardi's piece depicting the ducal barge, the Buccintoro, as it sails out to the Lido for the Festa della Senza, the mythical marriage of the Doge of Venice uh, to the sea. And Guardi has used these three principal churches and the bell tower of St. Mark's as the visual anchor points of his painting. So on the left, uh, in profile, one has the facade of San Giorgio Maggiore, and then a little bit to the right in profile, one can see very clearly the church of the Redentore. On the right, the Doge's Palace and the bell tower of St. Mark's, and slap bang in the center of the composition, just in front of the flagpole on the Doge's barge, is the Church of Santa Maria della Salute. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for your interest. And should you be visiting the city of Venice soon, happy travels.